This is, of course, the fourth of a series of educational meetings on the Russian Revolution. Um, and whether you're here in person tonight or uh, whether you're watching online, uh, I hope that you'll watch the other ones as well. I mean, I feel in some senses this is the uh, rather downbeat mm -hmm. end of the whole thing. I mean, Alex Kalinikos begins with a broad sweep of the struggle for workers' power. Kevin Cordos talks about a uh, crucial turning point which enabled the Bolsheviks to lead the working class to victory. And then uh, Amy Leather spoke about the smashing of the capitalist state and the potential for humanity to live without uh, state power. And now I'm going to talk about how it all went wrong, um, which is unfortunate, but necessary. Uh, necessary because, of course, uh, any examination of the Russian Revolution comes up against the objection, well, that was all very well, but didn't it end with the victory of Stalinism and an appalling dictatorship being created? And there's only two ways to answer that objection. Uh, one is to say, well, what existed under Stalin was, with a few imperfections perhaps, what we mean by socialism. That is, that's a logical line, but puts you in the camp of defending uh, the crushing of working class democracy, the crushing of opposition, the elimination of millions of peasants and so on, as well as the counter-revolutionary role that Stalinism played across the, the world, and therefore, you know, the complete opposite of our tradition of what socialism is really about. The only other task is to explain why this uh, great hope and potential was snuffed out, and that's what I'm hoping to do. And Chris Harmon's uh, very, very important article, How the Revolution Was Lost, is a tremendous arming of people against that argument that what happened was either inevitable uh, or in some senses uh, something to be defended. It, it, it goes against that. What I want to do tonight is sketch out uh, the basic discussion that Chris puts in his article and perhaps say a little bit more about some aspects of it uh, which I think are important. I want to talk particularly about how the uh, bureaucratic class was formed uh, in Russia and why 1928 was the key year, which is you know, slightly beyond uh, the scope of, th of the article here, but I think it's quite an interesting discussion about it. So what does Chris uh, put forward and what's the argument about it? Um, one of the absolutely key factors for the Bolsheviks in 1917 was that the revolution would have to spread to other countries in order to establish a socialist society and to prevent uh, reaction, overthrowing workers' uh, power in Russia. For two reasons. One, the immediate question around Russia was that the working class was a very small section of Russian society in a sea of peasants. It was possible for the two to be brought together in a struggle against Tsarism and then for the struggle for uh, workers' power, but nonetheless, in the longer term, unless there were working class reinforcements and development from outside Russian society, the working class would be uh, unable to continue to play this role. That the revolution brought the two together, but that the longer term they would be pushed apart without uh, the development from outside. The second reason, stressed more by Trotsky and the Lenin at the beginning, is that because capitalism is a global system, it's inconceivable that you can have a socialist society at the heart of a global capitalist economy, that the capitalist will seek by military means, but by financial means and economic means, to crush any socialist society. And therefore, unless there is a spreading to, in the beginning, one or two more developed countries and so on, eventually on a global scale, it's impossible for a socialist society uh, to be formed. And uh, as Lenin said, before the revolution, the Russian proletariat cannot, by its own forces, victoriously complete the socialist revolution. It can begin the process, but it cannot complete it. And then in his uh, famous letter from uh, the 7th of March 1918, the absolute truth is that without a revolution in Germany, we shall perish. 
we shall perish, very clear statement of the necessity of it. And of course we know that this was far from an empty dream, that the Russian Revolution set off a chain of revolutionary movements. Uh, yes, in Germany, in uh, Austria, in Hungary, in the Bielorossa, the two great red years, in Italy, the occupation of the factories and so on, and a whole number of other examples, not quite on the same scale, but nonetheless a ripple effect across the world as similar conditions and the example, the inspiration of the Russian Revolution very nearly created uh, further revolutions which would have buttressed um, the Russian one. It didn't happen. It didn't happen. We haven't time to go into it, but it's important to say the key issue was the lack of the sort of revolutionary organisation which had existed in Russia. The Bolshevik organisation was not present in those other cases. Instead, what happened was a shattering civil war uh, broke out in Russia as uh, the outside forces sought uh, to remove the danger of the inspiration of the Russian Revolution. So uh, within a month uh, of the October Revolution in Russia, uh, the head of the French military mis mission and the senior US officer had, for example, uh, visited General D Dunikin, one of the uh, white generals, the counter-revolutionary generals, uh, in order to fund them and to begin the process of uh, funneling arms towards them. By the close of 1918, the interventionist forces in Russia had reached a total of nearly 300,000 men, a very significant uh, level of military intervention. The French, the British, the Americans, the Italians, the Japanese, the Germans, the Balts, the Poles, the Greeks, the Finns, the Czechs, the Slovaks, the Estonians, and the Latvians uh, in a whole number of different areas of Russia. And by the summer of 1918, there were uh, 30 different governments uh, functioning in the lands that had previously uh, been the Russian Empire. And 29 of them were against the Bolsheviks. So you have this extraordinary situation of widespread foreign intervention, the counter-revolutionary generals seeking to overthrow the, 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 the Bolsheviks, and a squeezing of the existing revolutionary state into a small section uh, of the Russian uh, landmass. The Red Army eventually was able to defeat by extraordinary heroism and above all else by the politics of being able to appeal to wide numbers both of peasants and of workers against the return of the old order which threatened them with taking away their land, which threatened with the return of uh, all the old reaction but at much greater pitch as well. But the effect of the civil war was an appalling uh, shortages of goods and a economic uh, destruction. So, by 1920, for example, the production of iron was just 2.4% of its pre-war figure. Coal, 27%. Sugar, 6.7%. Electrical machinery, 5.4%. Cotton goods, 5.1%. And the human destruction was on an almost similar level. Between the end of 1918 and the end of 1920, the end of the Civil War, hunger cold and disease had killed something like 9 million people. Typhus killed 1 million uh, in 1920 alone. The economic historian, um, Ellen, what was his name, Lev Kritzman, uh, wrote, such a fall of the productive forces of a huge society of 100 million people is unexampled in the history of mankind. And the population, for example, of Petrograd, the storm centre of the Russian revolutionary movement, fell from 2.4 million in 1917 to 574,000 in 1920, a fall of 76% in the population. Now, these are extraordinary statistics, both of economic destruction and of human destruction, but they are the essential background to the situation in which the Bolsheviks found themselves. Not just the destruction of the population, but of the working class in particular. Um, it's estimated that the working class was reduced to about 43% uh, of its former numbers. And 
Many of them had, of course, been drawn into the working class at stake, because they'd been drawn into the army or the state structures and had been replaced in the factories and so on uh, by much newer layers of people and the former presidents, the former peasants, and so on. Which meant that by the end of the Civil War, the Bolsheviks were ruling in the name of a class which was at the best a shadow of its former self. Here was a workers' government, a workers' party, a workers' power, but the working class itself had almost been destroyed uh, by the process of the Civil War. And this is the extraordinarily difficult situation in which they had found themselves, that uh, they tried to keep together the existence of the revolutionary state, to continue to fight for internationalism and for workers' revolution abroad, but at home they were finding the most appalling economic and uh, political situations. And it meant, and Chris's article is extremely honest about this, that the, the idea that they, were, that they were ruling as a workers' government was at best, uh, a gross overestimate. In truth, they were not really uh, a working class government. And Lenin uh, himself said this in 1921, that what, um, with what existed was a bureaucratically deformed workers and pe peasant state, that what had emerged was a bureaucracy inside the party and inside the state, which moved it away from the democratic... Uh, ideals which had existed at the beginning of the revolution, even in this period of 1921. Inevitably, because in order to survive, there had to be much less opportunity for the sort of democratic norms which had existed earlier in the revolutionary period. It simply was not possible to have the free discussion, the uh, open arguments, which had, which had indeed marked all the earlier periods uh, in the Bolshevik party. You know, uh, obviously during the revolution itself, we've spoken about in these meetings about how the argument of Lenin, the April Thesis and so on, was argued openly uh, inside the Bolshevik party. Lenin found himself in a minority uh, in several important, uh, uh, several important uh, discussions at the beginning. The argument about the brest Treaty, which ended the war with Germany, for example, was a frenzied argument inside the Bolshevik party, but was an argument that was fought openly. The argument about the trade union question was fought openly inside uh, the Bolshevik party. The program of the workers' opposition uh, was freely distributed amongst uh, members of the Bolshevik party and so on. As the squeeze militarily and economically ca came, it was impossible to continue in such a manner, because the revolution had its back against the wall, it was barely able to survive and had to, if you like, run the whole of Russian society in a militarised form, in a militarised for form with harsh centralism and very little room for democracy. And these retreats, and they were retreats, they certainly weren't an example of what was, what was, uh, uh, what was the ideal, but were reflected economically through the period of war communism as well. That a, a government which had formed an alliance with the peasantry and had cooperated with the peasantry in the, in the seizure of the great landed estates and the breaking up of the land for the peasants and so on, now found itself having to seize the grain uh, of the peasants in order to be able to feed the cities and the army. In other words, anything else would have led to the destruction uh, of uh, the uh, regime and that would there have led to the victory of the most right-wing uh, elements inside society. Then you see uh, the revolts against the Bolsheviks, most notably the Kronstadt revolt, uh, in which in one of the places where the uh, Bolsheviks had had their greatest support, the Kronstadt uh, naval base, uh, there was a rebellion uh, against uh, the Bolsheviks. Now, I haven't time to go into all the details of it. Um, the Chris Harmon's argument in uh, this piece, uh, one of the main arguments he, he uses is that um, 
the personnel of Kronstadt had changed substantially uh, since the revolutionary period and that the uh, working class elements had largely been replaced by peasants uh, instead. Um, that argument has slightly been undermined uh, by more uh, recent developments in truth. There have been more research which shows that although, of course, that happened to some extent, it wasn't a decisive element inside it. And, you know, to me, it's never been the crucial argument. The crucial argument is uh, the revolt by uh, the Kronstadt sailors and others at the base, um, the demands they were putting forward would have meant the end of the Bolshevik-led regime. It would have uh, pushed uh, towards the end of the sort of uh, working-class peasant society which had been set up and therefore had to be resisted. Had to be resisted. Tragic though it was. You know, I don't think this is one of the, the great pages of Bolshevik triumph, the crushing of the, the Kronstadt uprising. And it sent a terrible warning through uh, the whole of uh, the Bolsheviks, that they were going to have to make a further retreat in order to stave off peasant uprising uh, across Russia. This led to the promulgation of the new economic policy, which instead of requisitioning uh, the grain from the peasants, allowed them to sell it on the open market in the hope that this would lead to a much greater uh, level of foodstuffs being produced. And it did have some success. It did have some success. There is an argument that's been put forward, been put forward by the right in, in the Bolshevik party and by some historians subsequently, that therefore this showed that the Bolshevik should have stuck to this position of a uh, much more open market socialism and opening up towards international capital and so on. This is the road uh, down which they should have gone. The trouble is, uh, this hides from the deep contradictions inside the, the NEP, the New Economic Policy, and that it had its own crisis-ridden conditions, which in the end completely undermined the idea that this is a way that uh, could have been uh, carried through. This is the period in which you see the emergence of Stalin. Stalin arrives uh, as the dominant figure uh, around about this period towards the as the, the NEP develops, but still a very different figure to the one he was after 1928. It's very important to realise this, that even, say, the Stalin of 1926 was not the same figure uh, as the Stalin of 1929. It's, and this is very important. But the contradictions of the NEP period produced massive problems for the Bolsheviks uh, and for the Russian state. The weakness, above all else, of grain production, the low per capita output of industrial goods, very high levels of unemployment in the cities, and a very high rate uh, of inflation. And also the level of military expenditure, which was half the pre-World War I level of the Tsarist state, so the, quite rightly the, the level of, uh, uh, of society's resources pushed towards the military and so on, uh, was falling very, very sharply. And all of these, given that they were surrounded by hostile states, required much more rapid industrialization to build up uh, the working class, to produce goods that could be exchanged with the peasants in order to uh, feed the cities, and to develop Russian society. But the great question was, where were the resources going to come from in order to build up uh, industrially. Now, for a long period, the leadership essentially tried to avoid this question and to just go slowly. But uh, Bukharin, Nikolai Bukharin, who talked about the pro procedure towards socialism at a snail's pace, that very slowly it would be possible to build up um, the uh, resources. But the central problem of just muddling through uh, was not able uh, to get over the, the question, particularly as the crisis developed from outside uh, factors. And you see in 1925, 1926, 1927, the build-up uh, of these problems economically and politically. So you see the closing off 
uh, of the idea that there would be revolutions in other parts of the world. In China, in 1925 to 1927, you see the disastrous policy uh, of Stalin, who first of all makes alliances with Kuomintang, the Shanghai Kai-shek uh, movement, uh, not a socialist movement, a bourgeois nationalist formation, which uh, delivers the Communist Party to the, the Kuomintang, who then slaughter the Communist Party, and then a crazed ultra-left attempt by the Communist Party to seize power, which led to the virtual elimination uh, of the Communist movement in China, at a time which had been incredibly hopeful uh, for the spread uh, of revolution uh, inside, the, uh, inside China. Then you see the defeat of the British general strike in 1926, largely because of the actions of the trade union leaderships, of, uh, of which the communists had uh, prettified the role of the trade union leaders inside Britain, followed by the closing down of uh, the economic links between the British government, who was the biggest uh, foreign trading partner uh, of the Russian state, um, and the cutting off uh, of investment from, first of all, from Britain, but then also from Germany and from France as well. So the, the, the resources for industrialization were not going to come from foreign investment, nor did it seem likely anymore that there was going to be a revolution in other parts of the world in this period. And this is where you get beginning of Stalinist theory of socialism in one country, that the resources would have to come from the Russian state itself, uh, and that only by a sharp change of policy would it be possible uh, to, to do this. Um, it was a time of deep crisis economically, but also inside the party as well. Um, I'm taking here from a book called uh, The Birth of Stalinism by Michael Ryman, which is a, an extremely useful book. Um, I'm, I'm sure, I, I don't think it's in print uh, anymore. You might find it in the second-hand um, section here. Chris Harmon wrote a book called The Grave... Uh, not a book, uh, an article called The Grave Digger, which is a, a response to Michael Ryman's um, book, which I would very much encourage you after t tonight to read, because it, this period is very, very important, I think, in understanding um, uh, what, what went on. Um, it, it talks about how the crisis led to a crisis inside the party as well. A wave of disillusionment, resignations rising in frequency, a war scare spurred by official statements suggesting war was in imminent, people rushing to the shops to buy whatever was available, hoarding of grain in the countryside, the peasants refusing to part with their surpluses and the modest reserves of manufactured goods falling very, very sharply. Now, this did lead to a growth of the left opposition, uh, the group around Trotsky, which argued that there needed to be, yes, industrialization, but there had to be uh, a heavier taxation of the richer element of the peasantry, but there also needed to be uh, a restatement of the internationalism of the revolution and a growth of democracy inside the Bolshevik party and the state more generally. And Ryman argues that the left opposition actually was much more powerful than many uh, other, uh, uh, other accounts have talked about. And I'll just um, perhaps a little uh, give you some a flavour of what he argues. Oppositional activity was spreading like a river in flood. Organised mass meetings of industrial workers in Ivanovo, Voshnoshensk, Leningrad and Moscow. At a chemical plant in Moscow, shouts were heard down with Stalin's dictatorship, down with the Pol Politburo. There were rumours of underground strike committees in which the opposition was said to be participating in the Urals, the Donbass, the Moscow textile region, and Moscow proper, and of funds being raised for striking workers. Um, this is, you know, a very, very strong element inside uh, Russian society. And Ryman actually gives chapter and verse to how... Um, Thank you. The, uh, the bureaucracy was very uncertain as to what to do in this period. It made deals. It compromised. Uh, it didn't have the confidence in the early stages to attempt to wipe out the opposition or to crack down hard. And this is a very different sort of regime to that which existed after 1928. Ruling circles dithered 
over what to do. Uh, Stalin, for example, at one point uh, argued for massive concessions uh, towards the Western powers, including the re removal of the Russian state's monopoly of foreign trade. But in the end, uh, such vacillation couldn't lead the way out of the crisis, and the leadership had to begin a series of ad hoc measures which changed the nature of Russian society back to one in which a ruling class ruled. Uh, the creation of a new bureaucratic ruling class and the beginning of the regime of what we call state capitalism, of the bureaucracy acting uh, as the personification of a capitalist class which, although it did not own the means of production, controlled the means of production and therefore acted in a way that was hostile uh, to the mass of the working class uh, and the peasantry. It begins with an attack upon the opposition. So the leadership used to send, for example, what were called fighting units into meetings of workers and meetings uh, of the opposition in order to prevent anyone speaking out uh, against the regime uh, that existed or speaking out against uh, Stalin. Then uh, there was the manufacture uh, of uh, what was called the Sak Shakti uh, affair, uh, uh, the Shakti case in the Donbass, where a number of uh, technicians, some of them foreign technicians, were targeted uh, as to be blamed for the problems inside uh, the mines, uh, the, the coal mines in the Donbass. Because of this, the idea that you could solve the problems of Russian society uh, by crushing opposition, by administrative methods, by a war against both the peasantry and the working class to screw out of them sufficient surplus in order to build up industry became the policy of uh, the bureaucracy. And as the economic crisis grew, the, the worst than usual harvest in 1927, the refusal of the uh, peasantry to deliver grain uh, to the cities, the repression grows much, much harder inside Russian uh, society. Let me quote again. Special powers were given the GPU, the, the secret police, the state police, to maintain surveillance over economic life and the activity of party organisation. The entire atmosphere in which the economic, government and party went on was abruptly altered. The extraordinary measures enacted in response to economic crisis began to change the pattern of economic and social relations. And therefore you see uh, splits inside uh, the Bolshevik party and a total transformation of the situation that existed, along with the terrorising of the opposition inside the party and of the broad masses of the population as well. In the end, uh, only the bureaucracy was able to emerge as a powerful enough force. You see, to rule, the bureaucracy had to have both an economic base upon the statized property uh, of uh, the society and also a political uh, base as well. Against them, the moderates, uh, the uh, Rykov, Tomsky and so on, tried to balance between the workers, the peasants and the bureaucracy. But this, as the crisis grew, this balancing act could no longer be effective. The working class itself lacked the self-confidence to pose its own solution to the crisis, atomised, broken up, facing repression. And therefore it could engage sometimes in passive support for the opposition, but was not capable of carrying out uh, another revolution against uh, the, 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 the Stalinist bureaucracy. The peasantry could offer passive resistance, but as with the peasantry throughout society, could not itself pose a solution to the problems of society. And the petty bourgeoisie, the small uh, property owners, the small um, owners that had grown up during the new economic policy, they themselves could not offer, uh, without uh, access to state power, a counterbalance uh, to the bureaucracy. Only uh, the Stalinist bureaucracy, at this time of the paralysis of the other forces, could carry through uh, a way through the crisis using the most crude and brutal mechanism in order to build up Russian industry, to develop it, 
to, to push through in a few years everything that had happened over decades during the period of the Industrial Revolution across uh, Western Europe and uh, other parts of, of the world. It was therefore able to provide for the military defence uh, of the state in a way which was not possible uh, under the new economic policy, but the, the, to do that required removing the last vestiges of the gains made by workers and peasants in 1917. And you'll be familiar, I don't want to go into the detail of it, with their, the reversal of the gains of the October Revolution and the establishment of uh, the state capitalist society. Now, what this means is that the essential understanding that we began with, the failure of the revolution to spread, was the decisive factor which eventually led to the, uh, the ability of the Stalinist bureaucracy to establish itself. An objective factor, in part, but which of course had subjective elements as well. What had been created in terms of political leadership and Bolshevik parties in those other parts of the world. The decisions that were made by the Stalinist bureaucracy against the left opposition. The intermingling of both the subjective and objective factors are what explains uh, the collapse and defeat of the Russian Revolution. It also tells us that far from revolution inevitably leading to dictatorship, what's required is the formation of the instrument of working class power, the Bolshevik party which had been created in Russia, that the lack of this and the failure of the revolution to spread was what decisive. And therefore we should learn from the defeat of the Russian revolution. Uh, not that revolution was a failed project or came too early or was the wrong thing to attempt, but that what was required was the carrying through elsewhere of revolutionary movements. Thank you. Thanks. Um, let me come back to something that um, Emma raised, which is about um, the question of other revolutions and whether this same sort of analysis can be applied and, and, and is it helpful to understanding. See, I think in, the question in Egypt is a more basic one. It's, it's less actually about did the revolution spread it's about was the revolution carried through uh, to the sort of October stage, if you like. Because what you see in, in Egypt is clearly a mass social movement, uh, crucially with the working class playing a very important role in the, the, the Tahrir Square was backed up by at crucial moments from strikes, um, which were the dominant factor in bringing down the Mubarak regime, the combination of the, the, the mass social movement and the strikes was uh, absolutely critical. But you don't see the thoroughgoing removal of the economic and social and political power of the bourgeoisie in Egyptian society. You don't see workers taking over the factories. Uh, you don't see absolutely critical the emergence of alternative forms of workers' powers, the Soviets, the workers' councils, or anything uh, of that sort. So the problem with the Egyptian revolution is you have this mass movement which is able to remove the layer at the top of the, the, the old regime, but you don't have the emergence of any sort of sense of workers transforming the economic base of society or beginning to run society in a different way. And therefore, it is relatively easy for the old ruling class to begin to uh, re-establish its power again. Um, this, is, this is the problem again and again uh, in uh, revolutionary movements which can remove the old regime but don't carry through a thoroughgoing revolutionary movement. So right from the beginning of this process we're talking about, in Germany, the Kaiser, the, the, all of the, the, the regime can be driven out, you can have this immense movement and you do have the formation uh, of workers' councils, of Soviets in Germany, but they're not able to overcome uh, the, 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 old, the, the economic base of society and establish a, a, a regime of workers' power. This is the, the crucial question that, that, that doesn't happen uh, in uh, German society. And therefore, um, 
what you see is sort of half revolutions. You see political revolutions without social revolution. You see a, a revolution that can destroy uh, the, the old rulers, but doesn't bring about a, a completely different form of society. And this is the distinctiveness, if you like, about what happened in Russia compared to, to, to these other ones. And uh, the problem in Russia is you have the Bolsheviks know that this has to happen. They know that, this, that it has to spread. It doesn't spread, and yet they remain as the ruling group inside society. So what do you do? You desperately try and hang on in the hope that at some point the revolutionary breakthrough will come elsewhere. You know, they talk openly about how the, uh, the meetings of the Communist International, people would watch with bated breath what was happening in Germany and so on because of this necessity of it. The problem is, because you have a small working class in a sea of peasants who are in the end a hostile uh, to a uh, different social class, in the end you have these repressive methods are necessary not our vision of what socialism, what the Bolsheviks' vision of socialism was, repressive methods are necessary in order to hang on. Uh, in order to hang on, you have to... The peasantry do not want to give up their grain, so it has to be taken from them by methods of repression in the end. Uh, this, this, uh, this is the difficulty right from quite early on that the grain has to be requisitioned from the peasantry. It's not, it's not an equal bargain, if you like. I mean, the Bolsheviks had a vision of how the peasantry would be won, won over by the mass production of manufactured goods. You know, but quite basic things. Nails, corrugated iron. This would be the language by which the peasantry would be won over. They would exchange their grain for manufactured goods. They would be won over towards more collective forms by the demonstration of model farms which would use animals, machinery, and so on, to show that collectively uh, you were uh, more productive and you could have a better life for you and your family than by working on your small uh, plot of land. That was not possible unless you had the mass production of manufactured goods, which required the development of industry, which required the resources in order to build up industry to provide all of this. In the absence of that, it was possible to, to feed the army and the, the cities and so on only by methods which were hostile towards the peasantry. Now, it's not the same as Stalin did with the uh, elimination of the, of the peasantry as a class, if you like, uh, in the period after 1928, but nonetheless, it, it was a reality. And Joseph's right. What, what, what you see is a, a series of quantitative changes in the democracy uh, of the, 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 the revolution, which end in a qualitative shift in 1928 as the independent class emerges and establishes itself by a process of war against the workers and the peasants in Russian society, and by doing so demonstrates its own class interest. And of course what happened is a whole number of what were temporary expedients in, you know, that could be justified as the requirement in hanging on were then put forward as a model uh, of what sort of society uh, should be established under uh, a socialist society. So the, you know, the banning of opposition, the removal of factions inside the, the Bolshevik party and so on, were, which were in, initially uh, were about a desperate attempt to, to keep uh, the, the, the thing going, end up as being put, this is what a socialist society looks at. And that's nonsense, of course. That's not what a, a socialist society um, would look at. I mean, I think the argument you need lots of peasants to have uh, a revolution. In fact, what, what looks the most propitious examples are one where you have lots of workers, not where you have lots of work. You know, Germany, a comparably higher educational level, cultural level, the number of workers involved and so on, had the German revolution broken through, which is not about the impossibility of it, but the, the, the lack of political organisation of our side, of the workers' side, and the disastrous policies at various points of the German Communist Party, had it broken through, 
the capacity of Russia and Germany together would have opened up much greater opportunities uh, for the, the economic development, the political development of Russian and German society together. This is the great tragedy of the defeat of the German Revolution, that it, it not only seals the fate of the German working class, but of the Russian working class and the peasantry as well. It's a, it, by blocking off the possibility of um, the, the transformation of society uh, through the extension of the revolution. On Kronstadt, you see, my, there's been quite a lot of research. I mean, in the, you know, Chris wrote this article quite a long time ago about what happened in Kronstadt, and it's slightly contradictory. Different people come up with different things. It's obvious there was many of the Kronstadt sailors, of course, were not the same ones uh, in 1920, 1921, as they had been in 1917. Because they weren't anywhere in Russian society. You know, that people were drawn into the war, they were killed in the war, they were drawn into the state machinery, and so on. But they, it wasn't a total transformation of, of the people in Kronstadt either. And for me, the critical question is less uh, a sociological and a demographic one about how many of them had you know, been replaced by peasants. It's what would have been the result if the Kronstadt rebellion had been successful, if it had uh, enabled, if it had removed the requisitioning of grain, for example, the cities would have starved. This is the, 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 the reality of Russian society. If the opposition had been allowed freely to operate by this period, many of the oppositional forces were hostile to the Bolsheviks and hostile to the continuation of the revolution. The, the left SRs had moved towards terrorism um, at this point, and therefore the allowing of them uh, to freely operate inside Russian society would have led to the extinguishing uh, of the regime and the return of the old order. And therefore my, the argument about Kronstadt has to be that However painful and tragic it was, it was necessary to prevent uh, those forces being victorious if the regime was going to hang on in order to try and maintain the possibility of the spread um, of, the, uh, of the revolution internationally. And that's the justification for it, it seems to me, one that, one that was correct. The left SRs, the argument over the, the, the Brest-Litovsk Treaty, the, the treaty with Germany, uh, the SR's argument was that uh, the, the, the Germans were asking for far too much, they were going to seize a huge part of the, the land mass uh, of Russia, and that it was possible and necessary to continue the war, that it was possible to keep fighting against the Germans, and, and that the, the Russian uh, society had the capacity to do this. The argument uh, that Lenin put forward was Look at the, the forces that we have at our command. We have to make this immense retreat to give in to German militarism, if you like, because we don't have the forces to stop them. Uh, and we will simply be crushed. And all that will happen is that the, the revolution will be defeated and we uh, uh, will not even have the capacity to appeal to workers in other parts of Europe in order to have, to have the possibility of the spreading of the Russian Revolution. Now, that was a harsh decision which the Bolsheviks made. It was a big argument inside the Bolshevik party. Trotsky had a different uh, position at, at various uh, points. The argument was, a, I think, a correct one. You have to make this immense retreat in order to, to hold on long enough for there to be revolutions in other parts uh, of Europe and in other parts of the world. And you know, how do you keep the cadre together and how do you keep the I think it's impossible over the it's not simply a subjective question of how you hold people together in the end if the revolution doesn't spread they will crush us you know in the Russian example it was particularly sharp because of the small size of the working class and the hostility of the forces arranged against them of course if you had a revolution in shall we say America in the modern world the resources available to hang on would be longer uh, than that uh, of, the, of the Russian working class. There would be more capacity to do so. Nonetheless, the same factors in the end would be decisive. In the end, the socialism in one country is impossible, even in the biggest and most powerful uh, country uh, in the world. And therefore, the necessity for the spreading of the revolution. And here, you know, we have to look at 
the revolutions that happened subsequently, of which there have been many, of which there have been many. I spoke about the ones in the 1920s, but think in the 1930s, the Spanish Revolution and, 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 and so on, the 1970s, the Iranian Revolution, uh, the great movements that took place in Poland in the 1980s, what we've seen during the Arab Spring and so on. What you don't see is the emergence of alternative forms of workers' power in some of those later examples, and you don't have the revolutionary organization at the center of them in order to fight for the transformation towards a fundamental shift inside society. Now, none of that is easy or inevitable, but it does mean the irreducible necessity of building of independent revolutionary forces can't be avoided. It can't be avoided, because without that, however great the movements may be, when it comes to the decisive turns, unless you have revolutionary organisation, all the old shit will return. Because it will not be possible for the working class to break through and to uh, found its own form of society and to spread it to other parts of the globe. And therefore, the argument about revolutionary organisation, difficult though that is, is an absolutely necessary necessary that comes out of an examination of the Russian Revolution, both in creating the breakthrough of October and of thinking how it could have ended up differently, not with the Stalinist dictatorship, but with a socialist globe.